Now, I must say a number of technical things, so conventions. Here, we will have to appeal to linear algebra, so please follow us. I'll describe everything in exact details, but it will be technical. And just to try to absorb as much as you can, and I'll show you some examples to explain and to clarify what I mean by those technicalities. We have a manifold, M. And let's say that this manifold is oriented, oriented locally by a basis of tangent vectors. Call them E1 and so on through EM. So small m is the dimension of the manifold. And a map F which goes from M to M. There are several objects that we'd like to consider, and we want to put orientations on, on them. First object is the diagonal. What do we mean by the diagonal when you have a manifold? We shall denote this diagonal by capital delta of M. Do you know this letter? So it's called the delta. You might have seen the lowercase delta, but this is the capital delta. And this is simply a set of this type. In other words, if you have M and M, delta is exactly, diagonal is exactly, oop, I shall draw it with, uh, with yellow, and here's yellow. That's delta of M. Okay, all the points on delta have equal components, x, y components, if you like. Okay, so that 45 degrees, so the slanted thing, is delta. But please remember that this is an abstract picture. It works in any dimension. Okay, so if you have a 100 dimensional space, you can take the diagonal, which lives in 100 plus 100, 200 dimensional direct product, and this diagonal is what we're talking about. Okay, so this um, is oriented by, so I'm going to complement the sentence before. Given the manifold oriented locally by these vectors and the map, we shall orient the diagonal by the following vectors. E1, E1 through EM, EM. What do we mean by this? What's this, E1, E1? Well, this is a vector. So it has some components, you know, the, 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 the components. That vector has length m, because we're in m, dimen m dimensional space. I just copy the same components underneath and make a longer vector of dimension 2m. That's what I mean here. And that makes sense, because you see, if m has, say, an orienting vector, which is like this, here also, there's an orientation vector. And what is the vector which points along M? Well, it's the vector whose horizontal and vertical components are exactly the same. For example, if you have a vector 1, 0, this is 0, 1. Well, what's the vector pointing along the diagonal? It's the vector 1, 1. So it's the same thing. It's similarly, 2, 2 will point along the diagonal. 3, 3, minus 1, minus 1, so on. So you should have the same copies of the components here and here. Okay, so that's how we orient the diagonal. There are m vectors, and that's going to be the basis, reference basis, that tells you, with respect to this, you have positive and negative orientation. Okay, next, the graph of the components. This part, as I said, is technical, so please bear with us. But we have to say this in order to use the intersection theory with its full power so that we can compute things. Next, 
the graph. I don't mean the graph in the sense of graph theory, but the graph in the sense of elementary mathematics. So this is the, we shall call it the gamma of capital gamma of f. And it is simply a subset of the product of this form. Yeah. Again, easy to see what it is in pictures. Sorry, that's m, that's m. Graph might be something like this. So that's gamma of f. Okay. And this gamma of f, we shall um, orient. You see the sentence structure? We orient the diagonal by this, the graph by the following. E1, so you put the vector there. And then underneath, we shall put the derivative of f applied to E1. And then so on. And then Em, derivative of f applied to Em. Why is this? Look at this picture again. And let's take, for example, this point. Okay. Suppose that we have a vector which is pointing this way with length 2. I ask you, what is the vector which is tangent to this graph and which is tilted like this? What are the components of this vector? Well, the horizontal component is 2. And what's the vertical component? It's the derivative at this point times 2. Is that clear? It's not. If it's not, that means that you did not learn calculus. The slope is simply equal to this over this. So if the slope is derivative, if this is 2, this is derivative times 2. If this is 3, it's derivative times 3. If it's minus 1, this is derivative times minus 1. OK, so the vertical and horizontal components are if this is E1, this is derivative applied to E1. OK, so that's why we take those vectors, and those, all those vectors, m vectors, each one has length to m, are tangent to and define the basis, orienting basis, for the graph at each point. OK? So that's the orientation of the graph. And finally, there is a third thing that we have to orient, which is m cross m. This is the simplest one, by the following vectors. E1, 0. This is a vector of length 0, uh, length m, all entries 0. And then em to 0. And then we have to have some others, 0 e1 and 0 en. How many vectors are there? Now there are two m vectors. That makes sense because the dimension of m cross m is not m but 2m. And that's what we shall take as the orienting basis. OK. The, all these um, statements make sense dimensionally because note that the dimension of the diagonal of this manifold is equal to the dimension of the graph of this, which is equal to the dimension of the manifold itself, and it is equal to m in this case, small m. And also the dimension of the ambient stage, if you like, the ambient space, m cross m, is of course twice that dimension 2m. We notice immediately that the dimension of the diagonal plus the dimension of the graph equals the dimension of the ambient space. So the overflow is 0. That means that we can start talking about the intersection numbers. Graph and the diagonal intersecting discrete points. We can count whether the sign is plus or minus thanks to these orientations, count the intersection number, and use the powerful machinery of intersection theory to 
deduce all sorts of conclusions about the map. So, we can play intersection theory. with the diagonal and gamma the graph inside M cross M. And indeed, that was our motivation. When you look at this picture, the fixed points, which correspond to the roots of the equation, are exactly where the graph and the diagonal intersect. Those are the points that we would like to detect, and we also would like to know whether there are such points which corresponds to the question, are there roots of the equation? Okay? Good. Now, as I said, this description, accurate and complete though it was, was rather technical. Let's look at, what shall we look at? An example to know how to do this in practice. And here I'll be asking questions, so please don't be shy. An important example then, in order to understand what all these things mean in practice. Consider a map that goes from R2 to R, R2, a map of the plane itself. And we shall say that this map sends the point xy to the point x squared minus y squared over 2 xy. OK, that's a certain map. For example, the origin goes to the origin, as you can see, and many other points. OK. Do you recognize this map? Have you seen it before? No? I can no longer trust this silence as meaning no, because a moment ago I asked, have you seen the Jordan Curve theorem? And it, it was silent. I thought it was no. But you know, clever people like Taboka started saying, oh, yes, yes, I have seen it uh, 30 seconds later. So have you seen this before? Yes, you have, but in disguise. Consider the complex number representation z equals x plus ly. If I take the square of this and divide by 2, the real part is x squared minus y squared over 2. The imaginary part is xy. So that's what it is. So the map is, in fact, in complex number representation, z goes to z squared divided by 2. That's what this map is. Okay. I hope, then, that you can picture, visualize what this map does. Can you? Do you know what it means in complex numbers to multiply? In particular, do you know what it means to take the square of a complex number? Do you have a geometry of this? I hope you do. If you don't, you're keeping silent. You should come see me after class, and we'll revise. But it's a very, very fundamental thing. OK. So that's the map that we shall consider. now. I have to ask you, what is the derivative of this map? How do you calculate the derivative of this map? Do you know? It's a map from two dimensions to two dimensions. If you have a map, a function from 1D to 1D, all of us have been calculating derivatives for many, many years. But what's the derivative of such a thing? Any idea? Component -wise. Component-wise, OK. So what is the derivative going to be? Is it going to become a vector? Yes. Is it going to become a scalar? Is it going to become something else? Fredo, what do you think it's going to become? What's the map? What's the derivative? Audrey, have you ever heard of the Jacobian? You have not? Somebody says yes. Who said yes? Mon says yes. So what do we do? The derivative of this is a combination of partial derivatives and 
It's not a vector, it's a matrix. We should remember this because this is really fundamental. It's the first thing that we learned in calculus, multivariable calculus, and it's the last thing we should forget. <laughs> because after all, you recognize the importance of the derivative. What do we mean by derivative? If you think that the world you live in is one dimensional, then fine, just remember the, what the derivative is in 1D. But do you live in the one dimensional world? No, I hope not. I personally live in a higher dimensional space. So, I want to have the concept of the derivative well understood in all dimensions. So, what it does is the following. You take this component and you take the partial derivative with respect to the first variable. So, you get this number here. Here, you get the same component, but you take the derivative with respect to the other variable. And you can now guess what the other two entries are. It is this, and it is this. I'd like to ask Audrey, have you ever come across anything like this in your life? Huh? Somewhere before. Well, this is what the derivative of a multivariable higher dimensional function looks like. I hope you can understand the pattern. Okay. So, let's calculate this. What are these? Well, it's easy, right? Derivative is going to say x minus y, y, x. That's what it is. Do you recognize what this is? If you are thinking in terms of, bless you, for complex numbers, this should become quite clear. Okay. And that's called the Jacobian by most speakers of English and French, but in fact, Mr. Jacobi was a German, Jew of German origin, so it should be called the Jacobian, not the Jacobian. Good. Well, that's the derivative. Let's look at the orientations. Um, we shall orient. Let's define two vectors that orient R2. Okay? They don't have to be 1, 0, 0, 1. Any two linearly independent vectors will do, so I'm going to write down 1, 2, and 3, 4. Are these linearly independent? Yes, they are. They are not parallel to each other, so they are linearly independent. So if these two vectors have been chosen to orient R2, then we shall start orienting the diagonal, the graph, and the product. The diagonal is oriented by what kind of vectors? Let's look at this. That's E1, that's E2. So what's the first vector of the orienting basis for the diagonal? Hmm? 1, 2, and then what? 1, 2, 1, 2. Thank you very much. Who said that? Trevor said that? Or somebody? OK. And then what's the next vector? Huh? Sarah, you have an idea? Huh? 3, 4, 3, 4, exactly. So that's what this means. OK, so that's going to be or, or the orientation. There are two vectors. This is two-dimensional. And that's the basis. So if you take another basis, you can decide whether the basis you have taken is positive or negative, the same orientation or the opposite orientation with respect to these. OK. Next. What about the graph? The graph of f, so that's the orienting basis. What are the vectors that we have to take? Now, t. What's the vector you have to take? The first vector. What do you have here? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can see that, right? So it's 
1, 2 here, because that's the first vector. Is that clear? And then, what do you have to do? It says derivative of f applied on E1. That is, you have to apply this matrix to 1, 2. Is that clear, P? OK. So what I have to do, let me write it in detail. So x minus y, y, x. Can you see this uh, from that distance? Applied on 1, 2. That's the first vector. It's going to have size 4. OK? What is this? It's 1, 2. If I do the matrix multiplication, I hope everyone can. It is x minus 2y, yes? And y minus 2x. Huh? Plus 2x. Good. OK. And then the, what's the next vector? It's 3, 4. And then again, x minus y, y, x. Apply them 3, 4. And if I do the calculation, it's 3, 4. 3x minus 4y, and then 3y plus 4x. OK, so those are the vectors. OK, good. For example, what do I mean by those num symbols, x and y? For example, let's say that you want to have the orienting basis at a certain point. At the point, x, y, let's say that we take the point 5, 6. What I'm doing is simply the following. Look at that picture of the graph again. You see, the orientation vector or basis at this point is this one. But if I go here, it's this one. If I go here, it's this one, and so on. You see, the vector changes, the basis changes. So at some point x, I have a certain vector. Another point x, I have some other vector, and so forth. That's why you have this dependence on x and y, depending on where you are. So let's calculate what the um, orientation vectors are at the point 5, 6. Well, it's easy. All you have to do is to plug in 5 and 6 into those numbers. So it's 1, 2. Now, what is this? 5 minus 12. What's this? Minus 7, I think. And then 6 plus 10, 16. That's nice. And then, what's this? 3, 4. 3x minus 4y. What's that? The first person who answers gets an ice cream. Minus 9. I was first. <laughs> you have to be quick. Is this even correct? And then the next one is 38, apparently. OK, so that's what it is. OK, you understand it. And finally, what's the orientation basis for m cross m the product? That's the easiest one. Teriso, for example. Is that his name? I think so. Hi. Celiso, what are the orientation vectors for m cross n? m, this is in fact r2 and r2. So maybe we should have written that small instructive. This is diagonal of inside r2. Okay? Now, what's the orientation vector? According to this recipe, we have to take those vectors. OK? How many vectors will I get at the end? Say this one. Huh? What times two? Two times two. two. What's two times two? Four. Four. OK, four vectors. And what are the components of the vectors, please? The first vector. What's that? Look at that. 1, 2, 0, 0, that's correct. And the second one? 3, 4, 0, 0, thank you very much. And the third one? Zero, zero, no, no, it's a little. 0, 0, 1, 2. OK, we have understood everything. So, and then the fourth one is, of course, 0, 0, 3, 4. OK, so those are the orienting vectors. Okay. And the question is whether the intersection of the diagonal and the graph is positive or negative inside this product. 
So we have to figure out whether the joint orientation of those two vectors and those two vectors is of the same sign or opposite sign as the orientation of these things. Okay. And that's something that we discussed on the exercise sheet. Many of us did not get there, but you can do this by comparing the signs of the de <coughs> determinants. Okay. Are you more or less happy with this? You have not yet um, all passed away? Okay. Let us say a few more things in preparation for tomorrow. So that we have one night to sleep over, tomorrow morning will be even smarter. The, we understand, thanks to that example, what those orientations mean. Here is a definition then, the central object of the chapter that we are discussing. Let M be an oriented manifold. dimension say M and consider a map from M to M. You understood how important this kind of thing was be a map, self map. And of course we are assuming that this map is maybe differentiable, continuous and so on. The Lefschetz number due to a great mathematician around the middle of the century called Solomon Lefschetz of f is simply equal to the following quantity. Do you know this letter? Lambda. It's lambda, and it doesn't, it's not a picture for somebody walking, but it does look like it. <laughs> it's capital lambda of f, lambda, l, as in left is equal to the intersection number of the diagonal with the graph. That's the definition of the left number. Why is this number interesting? Again, look at the situations such as this. If you have the graph of something and then the diagonal, do you remember which parts of this picture represent the fixed points? The, exactly the points where the graph and the diagonal intersect. Those are the fixed points of this map, which I'd like to remind you, in terms of motivation, can then represent the roots of some equation and so on. So, let's just number by simply calculating how many intersections there are, how many fixed points there are, but with sum, plus or minus. Okay? Algebraically counting. So, that's what the left number is. It's very easy to um, understand. Now, the theorem which is extremely important and extremely easy, is the following. If the, this manifold is closed, this oriented manifold is closed, then the left shift number of F is invariant under the formations. Of F. That is invariant under isotopy of the graph of F. In gestures, say that you have a map which takes a manifold and then does something to the manifold. Okay, transforms the manifold, it maps the manifold itself. Suppose that you have a left number of this map, which represents how many fixed points there are, as I explained. And now, let's start deforming this map. Maybe you don't like the map because it's too complicated. Maybe you don't like the map because it looks like Tadashi and you want it to make it look like Barry Green instead. And then you start deforming the map yes, to something much easier, much more handsome. In the course of the deformation, are you going to change the number of fixed points? No, you don't, because according to that theorem, the left number is invariant under isotopy. 
But you see what power this approach has. We are effectively saying, if you want to solve an equation, you can deform that equation to something simpler, provided the deformation is continuous, and then the number of roots that you get is the same as before. So instead of solving a difficult problem, we can solve an easier problem. And then, having solved the easier problem, we can deform back and find a solution to the original problem. Does this sound familiar? Yes. We saw such examples on, the, on day one, last week. This theorem is extremely important, but it's obvious, because we know the intersection theory. Yeah? Intersection number is invariant under isotopies, and left shift number is just a special kind of intersection number, so the proof is obvious from the central theorem of last chapter, theorem 17. Good. I shall go a little over time and discuss this theorem on an example. Always examples, examples. I don't like just stating a theorem. I would like to see it in action. Let's see how to calculate a left shift number in practice. Okay? And we shall take a rest after that. Example six. What's the simplest um, map of the simplest closed manifold? Well, you might be tempted to say, how about R? But you see, R is not closed. That's a problem. And the intersection number required for its invariance that the manifolds be closed. You remember? Sometimes, if you don't have closeness, the intersection point falls off the boundary. That's bad. So the simplest example is that of a circle, not of a straight line. So rotation of this one-dimensional circle by, let's say, angle alpha. So we have f which takes a, an angle and maps to theta plus alpha, let's say. But if this result exceeds 2 pi, of course, we have to subtract 2 pi. So we are talking about modulo 2 pi. I hope you understand what this means. OK. How does that work? You have a circle, and you are rotating the whole thing by angle alpha. Stonk. OK. This rotation has no fixed point, as you can see. Well, we have to assume that alpha is not the multiple of 2 pi. I mean, because if you rotate by 2 pi, of course, everything is fixed. But suppose that alpha is not 1 of 2 pi or 4 pi or something like that. Assume that alpha is not an integer multiple of 2 pi. Then this map has no fixed point, right? Every point moves. OK? Well, so. According to theorem 5, the left shift number for this map, which is still confusing, but what should the left shift number of this map be? There are no fixed points. Some people are very shy in saying. Taboka? Yeah. How about the center of the circle? I think it is. No, no, no. Uh, that's a very good question, but it's also, if I may say so, a careless question. Do you remember from day two that we spent a lot of time speechifying about the difference between a circle and a disk, sphere and a ball? When we say a circle, what do we mean? We s in elementary terms that people have learned a long time ago and some uneducated people continue to use, circle means the circumference. A disk means the entire solid thing, including its size. So this picture does not have a center. Clear? OK. So good. I'm happy that somebody asks such questions every once in a while. But before long, we should really get used to the conceptual distinction between a circle and a disk, sphere, and balls. Otherwise, as you can see, even somebody as clever as Taboka and I get perpetually confused. And you know? People who don't make this ter terminological distinction continue being com confused for the rest of their lives. That's a waste of time. Well, so what's the left shift number? It should be zero, because there are no fixed points. Let's draw a picture like that. Although 
In this case, it's intuitively easy to understand what's going on, but let's draw the picture nonetheless. So this is the picture of S1 cross S1, or M1 cross M1, if you like. And what's the diagonal? The diagonal is going to be denoted in red. It's simply this one. That's the diagonal of S1. All right. Is that OK? And then, let's say that alpha, let's say that this entire length is 2 pi, between 0 and 2 pi, yeah? So, in fact, this point is equal to this point, and this point is equal to this point. So we live not on this square, but rather on a torus, in reality. Here is alpha. So what is the graph of theta goes to theta plus alpha? That's easy. I hope it is easy. Do you know how to draw the graph of y equals x plus 1? I hope you can. It is equal to this. But then what happens when I reach here? Well, you see, this point, point 2 pi, is the same point as this. So I reappear here. It's a periodic picture. And this point is the same point as this point. OK? Is that clear? Because at this point, the x coordinate is 2 pi, but it's the same thing as 0 on a circle. And y component is the same. So that's the picture of gamma of f. How many intersections are there in this picture between yellow and red? No. Of course, there shouldn't be any. So the um, left shift number is 0. You should note what this picture really is. So this picture, in fact, in reality, lives on S1 cross S1, which is equal to T2. Sigma 2, if you like. So the real picture looks like this. Um, I'm going to draw two pictures, so let me draw them a little smaller. Here is a picture of a torus seen from above. Of T2. Okay? Can you imagine a torus like this? Okay. What is the graph? Of the, what is, excuse me, the diagonal, it starts here, let's say. Um, so let's say that this is one of the S1s, and the other S1 is like this. <coughs> Bless you again. I hope you are not catching cold. Okay, that's one S1, and the, this is the other S1. So the graph of delta, the Diagonal looks like this. It starts here, and it's a, it looks like a circle as seen from above, and then goes in the back. Do you know what this is doing? So imagine the torus. This is this part of the curve is on this side of the torus, but then it goes under, and it's on the other side of the torus, and it comes back. That's the picture of of the uh, diagonal. Okay. What about the picture of the graph? Well, at this point, I'm already a little higher up. I have to rotate this S1 by a little angle, so maybe it's here. And in fact, what this looks like is this kind of circle, which is slightly shifted. I hope I can draw this here. So that's the graph of gamma and they don't inter intersect. I hope you can see this, and if you cannot, we can sort of try to see um, by dancing a dance of some sort. OK. That was easy. I'm going to mention yet one more example, and then we'll finish. That was translation or addition by a constant angle, alpha. Let's do multiplication. What happens if we consider a map which multiplies angles? Next, let's fix some number n, which is an integer. Consider the map, another map, which I shall also denote by f, which sends theta to n times theta, again, modulo 2 pi. 
Yeah. And that's, again, a map from S1 to S1. What does this map look like? Here's what it looks like. Take a circle. Like this. And let's cut the circle. Do you see what I have done? I have a circle and I cut it. And then, you see this circle that has been cut is now segment between 0 and 2 pi. I have to stretch every theta to n theta, which means that I take this rubber band and then stretch it to n times its size. Okay, theta goes to n theta. I have to make it n times longer. So it's going to be a lot of effort. Like this. Okay. And having stretched n times, this n times long thing, I have to then remember that you see this is 0 to 2 pi. This is 0 to 2 pi, this is 0 to 2 pi, this is 0 to 2 pi. So 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, 8 pi, or something like this. But you see, this point, 2 pi, should be the same as this point, 4 pi, because we're doing mod, mod 2 pi. So all I have to do is to make sure that well, by the time I come here, I go back. So I have to wrap it around on itself n times. And stuck together. And then, I squash the whole thing. This is geometrically what the map is. OK. So a point somewhere here might be, might be a point here. When you stretch, it's a point here. But then, this is perhaps 6 pi times something, plus something. But that should be the same point as this point. So I have to sort of wrap it around and see where this point goes. and the, the um, final result might be somewhere here. That's the geometry of this map of uh, n times the angle. What is the picture that corresponds to this uh, product and graph and so forth? Here is what it is, and it's very instructive, so I hope you enjoy it. The diagonal is the same as before. Um, that was in red, wasn't it? That's the diagonal. I'm sorry, this is, uh, I should have drawn it a little bit like that. OK. What is the graph of theta goes to n theta? Do you have any idea? What's the graph of y equals 4x, four, four for example? Do you have any, any idea? Of course. It looks like this, right? But this point is the same point as this point. So I have to keep going up with the same slope. And so I have this picture of gamma. Okay, so this is 0, 2 pi, and that's 2 pi. Question. We have to figure out the number of intersections of delta and gamma. How many intersections are there in this picture? Ah, interesting. Who said three? Please uh, identify yourself. Who said three? I heard three. No? Nobody said three? One, two, three. You think it's four, but in fact, not four, but three. Why? Because this point has coordinates two pi and two pi. But that's the same thing as zero, zero. Is that clear? Because we are doing in a circular fashion. So that point is the same thing as this point. In other words, there are n minus 1 intersections. Hmm? D 
this point is not counted because mod 2 pi, it is the same, same point as this point. N minus 1 intersection points all with sine plus 1. Why is this? Because delta, gamma, like that, the ambient orientation is like this. So it's positive here, it's positive here, it's positive here, so plus 1. Therefore, the left shift number of this map is equal to n minus 1. You can see that when n equals um, 2, there should be one intersection. When n is equal to 3, three intersections. When n equals minus 10, then there are minus 11 intersections. What does that mean? That, no, minus 11, that means that there are 11 intersections but with negative sign. So when I say this plus 1, it's in fact not quite right. If n is positive, because the slopes are like this, if n is negative, slopes are like this. So you get negative intersection. Uh, it is not 0 and 0. What if n is 0? You get something like this. In that case, delta here, gamma here, that's opposite to the ambient orientation. So 0 is in this case. And you can see that when n is 0, you get minus 1 intersections, which is one intersection, but with a negative sign. OK, that's enough. I hope that this somehow clarifies the mechanism by which we can, in practice, compute the leftist number. You can see that the leftist number is very easy to define, but somewhat difficult to compute. You have to keep your cool in order to compute, but it's computable. We shall not make many computations of leftist number. This is probably as hard a calculation as, as we shall do this week. Okay.